OK, first of all, I want to introduce you concept. What are tick size constraints? OK, think about the variation economic model we learn. There's actually implicit but important assumption is price is continuous, right? But in reality, actually, price is not continuous. We have discrete price. Why there's a discrete price? There are different reasons. But one of the major reasons is like the market is, is not designed by us. Sometimes it's designed by regulators. And there's some rule called SEC Rule 612. It prohibits subpenny pricing. OK. So what does that mean? That means if you trade in public exchange, you cannot display an order with increment less than one penny. OK. And here's one graph. This is the, uh, think about this one as a limit order book. OK. This is the pricing grid. So every quote should be in the increment of at least one cent. OK. So the price between the two minimum uh, price increment is called tick size. OK. And in US, actually, it's pretty interesting. It's like any stock with price one dollar above have one penny tick size. So the relative tick size is actually quite different. Low price stocks have a higher relative tick size, and high price stocks have lower relative tick size. OK, this is the first concept. And the second one is called bid ask spread. Bid ask spread should be in the increment of one penny. So here is the best to ask, and here is the best bid. They, uh, they are in the uh, increment of at least one cent. OK, so the spread, actually, I think Ali asked this, this question, is best ask minus best bid, which is called spread. And there's another concept called a proportional spread. This one is more important, because stock can have different price. And the measure of transaction cost actually is in proportional sense. So actually, proportional spread is more important than the normal spread, OK? And so here are the liquidity providers. So they patiently submit limit orders. So if you submit a market order without specification of price, you trade with these guys, OK? So basically, uh, they are limit order providers. And the other important concept is called depth. What does depth mean? So the dollar depth means how many shares are on this limit order book. So generally, market micro structure, which is my field, think a tighter spread or a larger depth is considered liquid market. OK, this is not like funding liquidity or bank liquidity. This is, we call it market liquidity. OK, so we talk about one cent tick size constraint. Here is one of the major graphs of this paper, actually. It's surprisingly binding. For SP500 stocks, I mean, with price below $100, 50% of them have exactly one penny spread. So there's a big, if you plot that, I mean, there are different ways to plot that. You will find a huge cluster of one penny bid ask spread in this case. So what does that mean? That means, let's say, like, uh, uh, liquidity is decided by supply and demand. And at this point, let's call it, give it a name called natural bid ask spread. And actually, tick size imposes a constraint about it's a pricing flaw about the minimum price you can quote. So uh, this is the econ 101 like, graph, right? OK, then something called a surplus will happen. That means more people are willing to provide liquidity than people who are willing to demand the liquidity. So how to allocate between these guys who are willing to provide the liquidity? Speed. Because there's a general pr principle about price control is called queuing. OK, this is, you, you can think of these guys as the high frequency trading. OK, they're trying to get something. Most times, uh, maybe tofu, maybe bread, or something like a, like a grocery, whatever. And first come, first serve. OK, so what is high frequency trading? I mean, one important aspect of high frequency trading is like, uh, suppose you and me, suppose, like, let's say, Eric and me are both willing to provide liquidity at one cent. And Eric happened to be faster. Then he has time priority. That means he will be able to provide the liquidity. And I was crowded out. So uh, uh, if you have n not know the like, literature of high frequency trading, I want to give you some like, background. So there's a nice paper written by, uh, actually it's a survey paper, by Bruno Bier and Sarah Foucault about they summarize the existing literature of high frequency trading into two parts. The first channel is called a competition channel. So competition channel, they consider that as a benefit of high frequency trading. So the competition channel, what do, does it say? Competition channel said, if you increase speed, the liquidity actually improves. That means speed competition leads to better price competition. Actually, Albert has some very nice paper, actually. It's one of the pioneering papers published in JF, showing that it's maybe because of adverse selection. 
It, so what's the basic idea? Suppose like, uh, uh, let's say, uh, suppose John is faster than me, both of us, uh, uh, I'm bandit, I use your word. You're a market maker, right? If you can pull, withdraw quotes before bandit arrive, so in normal times, uh, you, you do not suffer from adverse selection. That means in normal times, you will quote a tighter spread. So if we measure time weighted, that means liquidity improves, okay? This is called uh, adverse selection channel. And the other one, uh, the, uh, the other way for understanding com uh, competition channel is like there's a recent paper written by J my friend Jonathan Brogard called inventory channel. What does inventory channel mean? That means if I'm fast, I can change my in inventory fast, maybe in milliseconds, something like that. That allows me to manage inventory. That, so I was able to provide a better price of liquidity. So this is competition channel. And the second one is the information channel. Uh, information channel have two important literature. The first one is that if I have speed advantage, I can, I'm bandit, I can adverse pick the market maker. Okay, this harms liquidity. Okay, there's a paper by B.A. Foucault and, and their co-authors uh, about this one. And there's a unique paper by Eric Budish, actually. I think one major point of Eric Budish's paper is that you don't need to know the information first. As long as you react to information first, even if you observe the information at the same time, you still generate some kind of adverse selection. So this is, there are two channels, competition channel and information channel. Why this paper? What does this paper contribute? We show an independent channel, which is not documented in the literature. We call it tick size constraint channel. First one is like I show is like, actually it's surprisingly, it's non-high frequency trader. This is the most surprising result. Non-high frequency trader provide the best price. It's not high frequency trader. What does high frequency trader do? It's like when there's a constrained price competition, they have com comparative advantage to post quotes fast at a constrained price to get time priority, okay. And also, I will show you several experiments. I mean, there's no information associated with high frequency, uh, the environment, but you can see an increase in high frequency trading. So this paper is like, information channel is very important. It's well documented. But I just say I want to show an additional channel of speed computation. Even without information asymmetry, you, there's still speed computation, okay. so. I show you one example, it's relative tick size. So uh, this is our summer period is October uh, 2010. At that time, actually, City is a low price stocks. It traded at $3.3. And HSBC traded at about $60. So you can see, actually, their relative tick size are quite different. So one tick of Citigroup, actually, is 18 tick of HSBC. So even if you quote one tick, that means if you compare to HSBC, there should be 18 price level, even for one tick, I mean, compared to Citigroup. So why this is important? I'll give you one example. So, so suppose you have a high frequency trader, Rabbit, and he's willing to quote like 30 basis point, and you have a slow one. I make that slow, okay. I'll write market later. So this, this is the Disney version. It's a mix of high frequency trading and Disney, I mean. So he's willing to quote, uh, the, oh, it's funny, but it's most in, uh, one of the most important slides because it conveys lots of intuition, I mean. <laughs> oh, uh, seriously, seriously. So the non-high frequency trader, it's not assumed because I show that. Non-high frequency trader is willing to provide 15 basis points, okay. Suppose relative tick size, less for city, is 30 basis point. It's very large, actually. It's much higher than their daily return. Then we start from the example. High frequency, 30 basis point. And now have you can see trader, 15 basis point. So what's the rule of tick, tick size? Tick size prevent people to bid to their marginal valuation. If you increase, uh, if you enforce 30 basis point, that means the slow trader also need to quote 30 basis point. So in this case, high frequency trader has time priority over non high frequency trader. So this is the first example. So what's the second example? Let's reduce tick size. So then it's the same example, 30 basis point, 15 basis points, okay? But in this case, tick size is smaller. And then non-high frequency trader actually is able to undercut the high frequency trader. In this case, actually, you find non-high frequency trader has priority over high frequency trader, okay? So this is, I mean, simple example, but it generates lots of intuition. 
So here is the main hypothesis of this paper. So we claim there is a non-information channel, which is called relative tick size. So larger relative tick size cause more high frequency trading liquidity provision. That means high frequency trading actually is concentrated in low price stocks in terms of liquidity provision, okay? Uh, but the challenge actually, uh, I know John Cochran who is here is saying the biggest challenge for empirical work in finance is three things, identification, identification, and identification. Okay, and identification can comes from two sources. One is like you can omit a variable when you claim this relationship. This variable, if they are correlated both with relative tick size and high frequency trading, then you have a bias. Uh, this one is more crazy actually, it's the reverse causality. It's like, it may be, I can easily show you a correlation between relative tick size and high frequency trading. But maybe it's like a, there's a reverse causality. That means uh, causality goes to the other way. Okay, so here is a, my identification strategy. Uh, one good news about uh, market microstructure, if you are working in empirical, uh, Ali, you have a question? I just jumped to the question. Okay. Uh, one nice thing about uh, market microstructure, if you, uh, some of them uh, you probably as students, it's like, uh, it's not that difficult to find identification, okay. I know you are smart enough to find that. Actually, the key variable here is the nominal price. But there's another uh, Booth faculty, Dick Siller, has a paper showing actually, price actually is exogenous. That facilitated my work. What does that mean? He has a paper showing actually, trying to, there are five literature try to explain nominal price, or relative tick size, and most, all the five literature fail. <laughs> so he finally find actually nominal share price actually only related to market cap. Large cap stocks have higher price. It's independent of like a volatility, something, lots of important variables. It's like firm truth, for some reason, I mean, it's called a nominal share price puzzle. So why this is important? Because I mean, if you have a real exogenous variable, your work to control endogeneity will be greatly reduced. So we start from uh, double sorting. Definitely, I mean, uh, yeah, some guys maybe say there's a five literature of nominal price. They offer lots of variables, try to explain relative tick size or nominal price. We include that in the literature. And then we have two very cool identifications. I mean, you can find that in market microstructure. I mean, you can find twin brothers in financial market. So what is twin brothers? I mean, twin brothers means you have different ETFs. Some of them track the same index, but they have different price. They are almost identical. And even more nicer about that is like, sometimes one guy split. So you used to have a high price ETF and low price ETF. When split, the high price one can become the new low price one. And you will find the relation hold. It's like original high frequency trading is in the new price one. But the high price one split, and the high frequency trading moved to the new high, low price one. So this is clean identification. So I will show you the roadmap. And the first one is double sorting, okay. Okay, so, so this is the main table of this part. So let me explain to you. So double sorting, we divided stocks into three categories. Large cap, middle cap, and small cap. So it's three by three. And uh, then within each market cap, we have large relative tick size or low price stocks, medium relative tick size or small relative tick size stocks, okay? And uh, the first one showing the case when high frequency trader is the unique provider of the best price. Okay, why we need a unique, you will see that immediately, why? And the second one is non-high frequency trader is the unique provider of the best price. But the third case is most important, it's like both guys provided the best price. So this is because of the tick size constraint, it's like I can, uh, suppose I, I, I want to quote a better price than Fajito and I cannot undercut, especially when there's one penny bid as spread, you cannot go forward. So in many cases actually you have, you see guys quote the same price, that's very interesting. And then I want to point your interest uh, to here. Here is the ratio. It's the case when non-high frequency trader is more likely to quote, so basically it's column two divided by column one, okay? And the first interesting statistic, this has not documented in the literature, it's like if you compare these numbers, you will find non-high frequency traders are 2.62 times more likely to provide better price. But what's the advantage of high frequency trader? It's here. So here you can still see non-high frequency trader are more likely to quote a better price than high frequency trader. But the difference is less than 1%. Why? 
because most time they quote the same price. It's like 96% of the time they are on the same price. And we can expect when they are on the same price, then high frequency trader have the way to jump ahead of the queue. I mean, they have an advantage, okay? And if you go to smaller relative tick size, you will find this number dramatically decrease. In this, this case, it's like only 4% of the time price, there's a price differentiation, right? 96% of the time, price are the same. If you decrease tick size, relative tick size, you will find, I mean, mo most times they are in different price, okay? Only 45.5% of the time, they quote the same price. And then you will see a huge, bigger gap of non-HFT only relative to HFT only, okay? So then it's interesting, this is best price. And next result is like a low price stocks, they have high tick size constraint, they have high probability. Both traders quote the same price, right? And then presumably HFT can establish a time priority in this case, right? So then the predictions, percent of volume with the HFT traders as liquidity providers should increase in relative tick size. And this is this graph. So here is large cap stocks. Okay, and this dimension is relative tick size. You will find as the relative tick size decrease, okay, and the market share of high frequency trading liquidity provision dramatically decrease from almost a half to about a third, okay. So an intuitive way to understand that actually is like the, what we observe is like high frequency does not make much market for Google, but they make lots of market for Citigroup. And I heard, I, I cannot confirm, it's like when Citigroup do reverse split, some high frequency trader been kicked out of the market because you trade on a smaller tick size and speed is not a, a, as important. I, I didn't confirm that, but more than one people told me about. So reverse split, actually, I will show you the result. I actually reverse split, reduce high frequency, liquidity provision, okay. Then how do we search for omitted variables? Actually, it's, uh, so if I talk with Dick Siller, he will say market cap, right? But th th I do acknowledge, actually, there are some literature on nominal price, although they have been disproved. So we know it's like, a, if we want to control for endogeneity, I mean, by omitted variables. So for a variable to affect the estimation of the causal impact, it needs to be correlated with two things. First, it needs to be correlated with price. Second one, it needs to explain high frequency trade, right? And uh, then actually this reduce our di dimension to search for control variables. It's the necessary condition for omitted variable bias is like you need to at least correlate with one of them, right? And uh, this slide I will be quick. There are five literatures on nominal price. So the literature basically tells you, I mean, what does nominal price? Be, being decided, okay? So the first literature is called uh, people reduce price to attract uh, like uh, retail traders. It's called marketability. And the second one is optimal tick size. Optimal tick size saying firm actually choose optimal tick size. So th this literature has been clearly rejected, but I still include that. It's like firm do not choose <laughs> optimal tick size. Why? Let me explain to you. Because there are exogenous shock to tick size. There's a regulation, and the firm actually does not respond to the regulation. So that means actually they're, they're not aware of the fact. And the third one actually is also interesting, it's called a signaling. Signaling saying is like they use price to signal something, okay? And also catering and distress risk, okay? There are five literatures. And there are factors that affect high frequency market making. So the first one I consider is information asymmetry because this is the information channel. I use the variable, I mean, ping, which is the probability of informed trading in my literature. And the second one, again, is coming from Albert's paper, it's volatility and turnover. I believe you also control for price and market cap, but that's, uh, that's already included in the first regression. And uh, then we met uh, referee and referee asked us to control for fast returns, so we add that result, okay. So here's the result, the number is small, but uh, looks small, but there are only two takeaway from, main takeaway from this paper. First one is like a high frequency trader are more active for stocks with large relative tick size. If you have low price stocks, there are lots of high frequency trading. 
if you have high price stocks, they are not as much high frequency liquidity provision. Okay. The second one is interesting. I don't think it's a document. I, uh, I think some people show that somewhere, but it's not clearly a documented. It's like whether high frequency trading are more likely to provide liquidity for stocks with information asymmetry. And our empirical results show the opposite. If you have a stock with a higher information asymmetry, there is less high frequency trading. So basically, what does high frequency trading do? It's like providing liquidity for stocks with relative tick size and a lower information asymmetry. OK. So this is a, a regression. OK. And f uh, the third one I want to show you is twin ETFs. And here is a twin ETF test. I uh, still have some time. So uh, if you look at, uh, there's a website called the ETF database. You will be amazed to find uh, how many duplicates they have, actually. Uh, many index have more than one uh, ETFs. And some of them have uh, even three. So uh, I give you one example. It's like a spider we know. But there's also one called iShares. I mean, some people call it IVV. Both of them track, track SP500 index. And they have different price. And then how can we do that? It's like we have a variable which is called liquidity provision uh, or market making. So here, why? It's like uh, it's a universal regression. The, I just simply change the dependent variable, but the independent variable are the same. So liquidity and HFT market making. So here, market making. I don't have good enough data, I mean, for this sample. So I use a strategic run or run in the process, which is a, a definition used in my literature. It's like as a proxy for high frequency trading. So what does this regression mean? First one, we control for interactive index by time fixed effect. So by control this fixed effect, that means I simply compare the HFT activity within each index group. So basically, I run this regression, but I just compare pairs, difference between pairs. OK. And the difference is it depends on two things. The first one is their tick size. And the second one is market cap. Some, some, some ETFs, they are di of different size, so we know. OK. And uh, what's the regression result? Let's think about the extreme case. Let's suppose, I mean, ideal case, there is no tick size constraint. So let's first assume transaction cost is only decided by fundamentals, OK? And if you track the same index, that means you, you should almost have identical transaction cost. Uh, what does that mean? If you have a low price ETF, they should have lower nominal spread. If you have a higher price ETF, you should have a higher nominal spread. Why? Because the proportional spread should be the same. The proportional spread is the most important thing. It's like the cost for you to transact a fixed dollar amount. Uh, and uh, if HFT activity is only driven by fundamentals, like news or something, because if it's a news for one ETF, it's the news for the other ETF, right? Because they are tracking the same index, OK. So here is a frictionless word. The result, actually, I have many results. I just show you four, actually. First one is like, what does this, this mean? This means if you have two ETFs tracking the same index, the low priced one, do have lower nominal spread. That's correct. The direction is correct. OK, high priced one have a higher nominal spread. But the adjustment is not enough to let them have the same proportional spread. So this result tells you if you increase tick size, your proportional transaction cost actually is higher. And, uh, but if you have a higher tr proportional transaction cost, then this is I call the price constraint. Then there is a longer queue, which is called depths, to provide the liquidity. That's the result I document. It's like at a constraint price, you have longer queue, people waiting. OK. And this is associated with the increase in high frequency activity. OK. So the basic idea basically is like a, a low price one have constraint price, longer queue, and more high frequency activity. OK. And finally, I want to show you the different diff regression uh, of ETF splits. So I use leverage ETFs. Why, why do I use leverage ETFs? Uh, goes back to Ali's question, because leverage ETFs is frequently split. And it's all, I should say, conditional return is almost exogenous. So what is uh, leverage ETFs? So it's ETFs which amplify the return of index. 
I'll give you one example. For example, uh, Dow Jones 30. They have a bear uh, e leverage ETF, and they also have a bull leverage ETF. So if Dow Jones increased by 1%, the bull ETF will increase by 3%. And the bear ETF will decrease by 3%. So think about it, this is amazing because it does not take a long time for their price to diverge. And these two ETFs, when they were born, they are exactly the same price because it's the same issuer. Okay, you think of them as twins. But finally, the, their price diverge, and then the, their issuer at some time, actually, they were split and reverse split. It's almost exogenous. I mean, and also, funny thing about that is like they have a group of split and reverse split. Usually, for different indexes, usually they happen at the same day. That's simply for convenience. I mean, so that's more exogenous, okay? So, so what is the treatment group here? Treatment is ETF that split or reverse split, okay? And the control group is the ETF which does not split or reverse split. Actually, there's an extreme case when one split, the other reverse split, we omit that case. But if we put it back, it's the same. Okay, so what's the regression specification? So again, this one is either liquidity or quality spread or depth. We, this time we control for index by time fixed effect. And we can also control for ETF fixed effect because we have exogenous shock. And we control for return. And there's a treatment variable called DITJ. What does that mean? That's a treatment variable. So suppose you are stock that being treated. The treatment variable is equal to zero before the treatment. And it's equal to one after the treatment. Suppose you split. After the split day, you have one, okay? And the control group is always zero because it has never been treated, okay? And so again, without a tick size constraint, it's like a, this, is, this one splits is more natural. It's like a, it's like a, I think uh, it's like a piece of pie, how you slice that. It does not change the fundamentals, right? So the result you predict is like price decrease. Usually if you split, the nominal price will decrease. And the nominal suppress should also decrease. Reverse split increase the price and also increase the nominal spread. Why? Because if transaction cost is decided by fundamentals, proportional spread should be the same, right? And also, suppose HFT activity are driven by information, whatever, fundamental reasons, it should be the same, right? And the next I will show you the result. Again, if you split, so this is a result on split, you will find a nominal beta spread decrease. That's almost like more mechanical because your, your price decreased by half. You cannot have the same transaction cost. Otherwise, I mean, there will be some problem. But here, okay, proportional spread actually increase. That means the spread decrease, but does not decrease to the same proportion as the reducing price. This is very interesting because there are some corporate finance textbooks who think split increase liquidity. Actually, it's wrong. Actually, split actually decrease liquidity. I mean, uh, some people showing split increase liquidity. It's like the identification is poor. Okay, and also depths. This uh, depths also increase. Although here it's not st uh, statistically significant. Okay, because why? Because split is less often in leverage ETF. Usually they do reverse split. Okay, so we have less observations here, and high frequency trading increase. Okay, uh, if you didn't get to the point of this slide, it's interesting. We have another cartoon. Okay, here is split. So let's think about a stock trade at a price at uh, around 100. And uh, there are some non-high frequency traders here, high frequency traders here, okay? Split means every one shares before becomes two shares after, right? If the transaction cost reduced by half, we should see something like this, right? But here, you don't have a price level here. There's a constraint. So you, you actually, you move these guys back to a higher price. So then you will see there are more guys here, actually. The depths actually increase. The proportion of spread actually also increase. And also, <laughs> uh, high frequency guys like this. OK. This is a split. OK. And uh, what does reverse split? Uh, uh, reverse split is a reverse, actually. Just so the spread will increase. So price increase, 
nominal spread increase, but nominal spread does not increase at the same proportion. So that means liquidity improve, actually. And the debts decrease. This is also mechanical, because in the old grid, some guys are forced to be on the same queue. It's not that they like that. It's just I, I cannot. For example, it's like, suppose Ramesh is smarter than me. He wants to bid a higher price, a bid a better price than me. But because of an extremely large tick size, let's say, uh, let's say one dollar, then we have to be together. It's not a, you, you like to do that. It's not, like we are forced to be together. OK. And then you can see a decrease in high frequency activity. So again, this is a, another cartoon. I mean, this one is a little bit uh, more complex. So here, let's start from previous example. You have HFT and non-HFT, right? Reverse split means now two shares is equal to one share. Then you have increasing price. As a proportion, you should see here. Right? But here is a unique thing. If you do reverse split, actually you create a new price here, which, is, which was not in this grid. That offers you an opportunity to undercut the price. So some guys will have ability to move ahead of the queue because of the new price level you created. So that actually, first one, you can see there's a decrease in the best depths because some guys remain on the older price grid. And some guys move one step forward. So depths decrease, but that's mechanical. But spread actually decrease proportionally. And also non high frequency guys do not like that. OK. So here's my conclusion. So uh, this paper, actually, I didn't say the previous literature is wrong. Actually, they provide lots of insight, but we provide additional insight. First one is uh, relative to uh, price competition channel. Price competition channel said, I mean, I mean, high frequency trader provide a better price because they have speed advantage. But we should actually is non high frequency trader provide a better price of liquidity. And high frequency trader are more active with relative large tick size when price competition is sort of constrained. And with respect to informational channel, we show like a split and a reverse split generate high frequency trading. Okay, but think about it. it's not related to information because. Usually, I mean, ETF have very less information. Even if they have information, split does not have as many of the information. The most important thing is like, even if that generates more information, it does not generate more information relative to your twin brothers, which track the same index. So information cannot explain the differences in HFT activity before and after ETF split, right? So there should be something non-informational which is the contribution of this paper. And also we find, actually it goes back to Albert's point, it's like uh, if you have more information asymmetry, high frequency traders actually provide less liquidity, okay? And uh, the final interesting thing is about the policy implication of this paper. So we contribute two things for the HFT uh, debate. Actually, it's interesting. Actually, I was once in a panel to discuss regulation on high frequency trading. And I finally realized it's like, uh, uh, guys sit on my left is extremely left, the guys sit, sit on my right is extremely right. Uh, so one guy said, okay, passionate, okay, this is the front run, it's very, very bad, we should do more regulation. The, the, other guy is actually, the other guy actually cited lots of papers saying actually if he, you should not uh, contain free market. It's technology enhancement or something like that, we should not regulate. And then the debate is whether we should regulate or not. And finally, it's my turn to speak. As, uh, speak, finally I said, okay, there's another possibility. It's like high frequency trading is created by existing regulation. And then both guys start to forget each other, uh, start to attack me. Uh, <laughs> 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 I, I, I mean, I mean, I mean uh, but it's, uh, I believe it's true. It's like, uh, because I, I think this workshop is all about market design. So come back to my question the first day, actually. It's like market sometimes it's not designed by us. It's designed by regulator, sometimes without a detailed reason. It's like one thing missing in the current policy debate is like very few people realize. I mean, the first step to do additional regulation is evaluate the current regulation. Unfortunately, it's forget. I mean, in, in the debate, it's like people talk about oh, more regulation, no regulation. There's a middle point, which is the existing regulation is enough to generate sort of high frequency trading. Uh, and then I was tapped by SEC. They talk about uh, they are considering like tick size. Uh, I was extremely happy. I said they follow my paper, but finally realized they want to do the reverse. They want to increase tick size. 
<laughs> and they are air my view, it should not be that, uh, but they don't listen. Uh, yeah, they don't listen to many of us, okay. <laughs> uh, Eric is correct, yeah, let me quantify. Is the economics thing at CEC are not excited about that. But SEC have lots of lawyers. So lawyers are connected. I don't say their lawyers are bad. They are good, right? They provide a necessary service. They are connected to Congress. <laughs> uh, yeah, they, they can be good. I mean, <laughs> uh, and then they want to do the uh, do a pilot study, actually, uh, actually to increase the tick size. But finally, finally, I, I realized. I mean, uh, I mean, the pilot program is not bad. I mean. Uh, because it provides exogenous shock to provide more data. Uh, that's good. Yeah, I said we should support that. <laughs> uh, I should support that. But I mean, I mean, uh, what they are, I changed my stance. It's like I, I think what they are doing now is like there are two arguments to increase uh, spread, actually. One, one argument is like wider spread increase liquidity. That's wrong. I, I, I can easily show that. The second one is like uh, it's simply off the wall. It's like saying if you wide tick size, IPO will increase. Uh, uh, if you have any question, I can, I can answer, answer, uh, provide their answer after the seminar. I mean, it basically, it's like, uh, yeah, uh, John looks confused. I mean, I was confused too, actually. <laughs> <laughs> actually, one of my students want to write a dissertation on that. I said, that, that's completely wrong. You don't need to write a paper to disprove that. I mean, <laughs> I, mean I, I show the opposite. So here's what my suggestion to SEC and also Congress. Since you have already done a pilot program, the cost is the same. Why not also decrease tick size for some stocks, actually? That will provide us with more data, which we like. Okay, so that's it. So, okay. I want to ask you another question about this, the classification of HFT and non-HFT. I want to raise a specific possibility. Yeah. Which is, so suppose there are two types of firms that in reality are high frequency traders. Yeah. Uh, some of which are, are completely mechanical and just look for yeah. uh, easy money opportunities that are only available if you're fastest. Yeah. Uh, so racing to the top of the book in yeah. Citibank stock is an example of a mechanical trading opportunity. Yeah. Exploiting temporary mispricings between equivalent ETFs is a mechanical trading opportunity. Yeah. And some high frequency trading firms that are fast and also do research. Yeah. So the classification that you guys use is mechanical HFT versus research HFT. And research, uh, high frequency trading firms that can do research also take some risk and um, don't, don't necessarily, would, and what I'm worried about is they wouldn't get classified as high frequency traders by this classification scheme. There might, so there might be guys who are very fast. Okay. Are at or close to the cutting edge of speed, but who wouldn't be classified as HFT. But essentially, what I think NASDAQ's doing, and what certainly what the classification Albert was using, yeah. there were some sufficient conditions where if a firm satisfied these sufficient conditions, then we can oh, do it with confidence that they're a high frequency trading firm. But okay. they're not necessary conditions. Okay. So a, a, better, a better classification would be co located guys versus non co located guys. I think that would be a simple. Another simple classification, co-located guys are willing to pay extra yeah. to be closer to the market, to, to willing to pay extra for speed. That's a, that's a different way to classify market participants as speed sensitive and non-speed third. Oh, that's a and I'm worried that there will be some firms that are high frequency trading firms, but that also take some risk and also engage in some non-obvious trading strategies that are gonna not come under your classification of HFT. Oh. Those are the guys providing liquidity in Google and Apple, but less so in Citibank. Just because in Citibank, it's more of a coin toss to get there. Yes. Oh, I see your point. That's a great point. So your point is like non-high frequency trader in the sample contains some high frequency trader, right? Okay. Uh, here is one thing I, I learned from Nick Hershey, who worked in Nasdaq uh, for some time. I think my result is uh, does uh, I mean it's an issue, but my paper will be less affected by the fact because he told me one requirement to, to be classified as high frequency trading is like uh, you have a you have a direct access to the market which does not share with your other business. So the non-HFT, some of them probably do some algorithm trading, but 
they share the same line with the other business, which means they are not as fast. So actually, I should, uh, yeah, that's a great point. I should put my paper, it's like, uh, maybe there's a difference. It's not against my story, but I should quantify that. It's like extremely fast to fast, not compared to extremely fast, uh, but doing some research, right? Yeah, that's a great point. Yeah, I, th I think I guess more concretely, I'll just push you to understand as, as well as you can how the classification works. Because you, you've identified a class of traders who are yes. in a very interesting way by tech size engineering. Yes. And in a way that's counter to some prevailing narratives about high frequency trading. Um, but you want to understand exactly who is in your bucket that you're classifying as HFD. Yes. And then who, who is in the complement. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I will call them again next Monday. Yeah, that, that, that's a great point. Yes, yes. So, so then how to quantify them actually that does not affect the result, but it's a sort of interpretation of my results. Interpretation. Okay, that's a great point. Yeah. Adam, you have a question? Uh, I was going to say it's that, but if you could, do you have to do it in two groups or do you think of it as a, as a continuous? Things. We know that some of the fastest guys would be in the top group. We know there would be some of the slower guys who are still or in the non HFT group. Some of this is an area of legal reserve. Yeah, that would be even better. Uh, that I don't know. Actually, that's actually my joint work with Alex Chinko about whether there, there's two peaks or, or it's continuum. So our conjecture, actually, we haven't tested that. Our conjecture, based on my like, series, there should be two picks, but we have never fit that into the data. Uh, so actually, the other thing is like when there's a speed enhancement, actually, that either creates some picks. That means some people, I mean, or it can destroy, that's a theory, it can destroy some speed. So one example is like, uh, like day traders. There's no day traders now. So that's, that's an anecdotal example of destroy of a peak. It's like either if you were day traders, now either you become high frequency trader or you join a hedge fund. Because there's very few room for the day traders now. But this is something, I mean, but the exciting thing about market microstructure is like there are many unanswered questions which are absolutely important. I hope uh, I can work with you guys. <laughs> I mean, yeah, any questions? <laughs>